This video was supposed to be the video where I make the case for why it makes sense to use a separate Golang backend with a SvelteKit frontend. Over the past six weeks or so, we've been doing this long ongoing series where I've been building out this example application using both SvelteKit and Golang. Golang has been the backend and then SvelteKit has been the frontend. But as many people have pointed out and as myself has pointed out as well, you know, this sort of stack uses two backends. We have a server in our SvelteKit app and we have our server in our Golang app and a lot of people been asking the question, why are we doing everything in the Go backend when we already have a backend in Svelte? SvelteKit has a server, it can talk to databases, it can handle authentication, it can hash passwords, it can do everything we need it to do for the purposes of this application, for the purposes of many, many applications, especially in the MVP phase and the startup phase. So the question was, why would you do it? And I had some answers and I was pretty confident in it. but. As I've been recording this video over and over again, and as I've been going through and trying to formulate all my arguments and reasons, I've come to the conclusion that I am a guy with a hammer in search of a nail. I wanted so badly for Golang to be the solution here, for it to be the back end, that rather than looking at it objectively and just saying, okay, what is the best way to solve this problem? I had a solution in search of a problem. And I think in this case, and in most cases, realistically, you don't need that separate Golang back end. And that hurts me to say, I want it to be that we have this cool separate Golang back end. It's fast, it's cool, it's really performant, it scales really well, all this stuff. And then we can connect it to our cool SvelteKit front end. I wanted that to be the best thing, but I can't in good conscience recommend that to most people. I don't think that is the best solution, and I want to break down why today. So in my sort of quest to figure this out, I went ahead and I rewrote the entire application, well, the data layer and backend layer of the application using SvelteKit's backend and Drizzle ORM. For those of you who aren't familiar with Drizzle ORM, it's the cool new ORM that's come out recently. It's super, super cool. This was the first time I'd really used it and I absolutely loved it. That'll be a video another time. This is going to be a code breakdown video. We just did that on Monday, so we're going to chill on that for today. Basically, what I did is I went ahead and I rewrote all the backend stuff to now just use Drizzle and PlanetScale serverless for our backend. So what we did is we replaced our Golang backend with Drizzle for the ORM, and then we're still using PlanetScale for the database. And this entire thing it's really, really compelling and it's really, really good. I went ahead and I built out the application. I hosted it. This is the live version of it. We can just go in here. We can go in here and do this. It's really, really fast. And most of this is running in the edge runtimes. So if you're interested in this code and this example, there will be a link down below and I'll probably do a video very soon breaking down the differences and what I did to change it. But for today, we're going to be talking about the high level reasoning behind going with just a SvelteKit backend rather than doubling up your backend and doing all this stuff. In the pursuit of doing this, I went ahead and I made some lists. So first and foremost, there's the Svelte kit over Svelte. I think this one is pretty self-explanatory and these days most people can get behind this. SPAs absolutely have a place if you're building a super like dashboardy type app where all you're doing is just tons and tons and tons of crud over tables and that kind of thing, like maybe a school classroom app or something like that, then yeah, of course an SPA makes more sense. You don't need all the bells and whistles of a meta framework. It, totally fine. But in my case, and in a lot of people's cases, like my company site Insider Viz, it's a lot of just serving static data. And just when you load the page, you fetch some data and then you display it out to the user, maybe some basic forms here and there, but nothing too crazy. So, you know, SvelteKit, it gives us a router. It gives us much better SEO control. It gives us a way to ship much less JavaScript to the end user. I got a couple of comments in my last video. I want to be clear. I am not a zero JS guy. I, I totally agree. And I think that is deeply silly. I don't think that zero JS JS should be a goal, but I absolutely believe in the concept of less JS. If I have a choice between shipping a basic HTML form and shipping React with tons of use state hooks and all this stuff attached to said form, I'm going to pick the HTML form all day. It's going to be faster. It's going to be a better user experience. And it's just going to be easier on my end as a developer. I think forms just work really well. They kind of got HTML right in the 90s. It's, you know, it just works. Um, we get access to form actions. And then one of the biggest things is we get this shared typing system from our front end to our back end. You can run a database query and, okay, we'll do a little bit of code here. Not much, but a little bit. 
So, you know, you go into our page.server when we want to load the data for our to dos, you know, we pull these out of the database and this is going to be strongly typed. So since it's coming from Drizzle, it knows what the type of the to dos are. It knows we have completed description title ID. We go ahead and we send these down to the end user right here, returning the to dos. And then when I go to my page.svelte, it knows exactly what it is. So we get these strong types. There's no declaring what something is, no dealing with any of that. It's I think generally speaking, this for full stack development is by far the best experience. So, you know, this is a pretty cut and dry one. I think most people can agree with this, but this is where things get interesting is the separate go back end. And let me be totally clear. I'm going to debunk a lot of these, and I think a lot of these are coped. So first and foremost, let's start with the headliner one that you're going to always hear about Go. It has far better performance than TypeScript. Yes, yes it does. I don't think that that is really negotiable. I think everyone can agree it has better performance, but does that matter? Are you realistically gonna see a big performance difference in a CRUD IO app, which is what most MVPs for most products are gonna be? Typically speaking, you're gonna be starting out by solving a pretty simple problem. The performance on just database queries is not gonna be that different between the two. The bottleneck is realistically speaking gonna be your database, and in this case, that bottleneck doesn't really exist anymore and we'll get to that later but you know performance is not that big of a deal of course as you get more complex and as you add more features this does become more and more of a priority you're going to be introducing stuff like websockets and in fact i think that's one of the strongest cases for having a separate go back and you know sure it does make a difference to have go if you need to handle all these different threads and that kind of thing but with the beautiful new runtimes we have like serverless and especially edge you know i I don't really see the argument as much anymore. I think that this is a very performant app and I, I know it's a to-do app. Obviously this isn't scaled up to users and obviously as we add more complexity, it gets loaded more, but you know, you can have infinite edge functions spin up. We realistically as developers just don't have to worry about that anymore. So the performance, I don't think matters that much. And then cost and scale is another one where it's like, well, if you're just running a TypeScript server that can handle a lot less and you're gonna have to scale that up a lot sooner and you're gonna have to pay a lot more for it. Go is, very cheap to run. I can tell you from experience running Insider Viz, I know, you know, 20K users is not that many, but like, you know, still, we barely pay anything for our servers. It's super, super, super cheap because Go is so freaking efficient. We're running tons of background workers, tons of asynchronous jobs, tons of stuff constantly going. And we don't break the free tier of railway. Like, it's a really fast, performant, and efficient language. No one can deny that. And TypeScript isn't as much, but the cost is not a big deal here because of the way we're running it. So I guess this is a good time to go into what we're actually running here in this sort of Svelte kit world. So this is not going to be an edge video that deserves its own video and its own deep dive discussion in and of itself. Edge is this new runtime, I think, is really whenever I say edge, I'm not referring to regional edge or anything like that. I'm referring to the edge runtime, which is a limited version of a JavaScript runtime, which has effectively no cold starts and is but it's lighter weight, so it doesn't have access to some of the APIs and it can't, for example, make a database connection. So what we're doing is we're leveraging edge on most of our routes. And the way we're doing that is with a package called planet scale, uh, planet scales package database JS. What database JS does is it allows us to connect to our database using a fetch API. So instead of making a full, uh, I think it's TLS off the top of my head, I'm going by road, just fact check me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it makes a full TLS connection. We have to set up this connection between our backend and our database. But here we don't have to do that. We just use the fetch API, which is just the way to make HTTP requests from JavaScript to connect to our database. So we just set up what our host and username and password are, and then they run all this for us. And Drizzle is very smart and very cool. And what they'll do is they'll just do this all for us. We can just pass in this connection and then have this tiny light wrapper around our SQL, which is really just raw SQL, but with a little bit of type safety added on top. You go ahead and set all that up, we get this connection, and now we're able to talk to our database from a server from a from an edge runtime environment hopefully all that makes sense there's a lot of terms in there that again deserve their own topic but the point is we're able to run all of this in effectively an edge environment and the pricing for edge functions is stupid on Vercel, it costs 65 cents per 1 million invocations of an edge function that means that every time you go to a page you're paying 
like basically nothing. One million requests is a lot of requests. And if you're building a business or something like that, there is no way you're not going to be able to easily make this back. This is dirt cheap. This is really, really, really cheap. Like realistically, especially in the startup type world, you're not going to have a problem with this. This is going to scale just fine. And it's super fast. It's super performant. And then when we look at planet scale, let's look at planet scales pricing. It is super, super generous at the free tier and the hot at the free tier and at the scalar tier. They really like they start to get you at the big enterprise and team plans. But like when you get to that point, I, I don't really care. Like if I get to the point where my database needs to handle 500 billion row reads per month, I'm very happy unless I did something really, really wrong or I have a very niche use case my app is probably making a lot of money at this point like to the point where i 600 a month is nothing and this is something that i personally didn't really understand for a really long time is i figured like you know this was something you'd hit overnight and you would have no money coming in when you hit this point but this is a lot like this is what people mean when they say scale and realistically if you get to this point where you're little where you're you have ton you have millions and millions and millions of edge invocations and you have like 500 billion plus row reads then you're very happy your app is going good and it did its job because it let you focus on actually building the app and that's sort of the next thing that i can sort of segue into is how good the freaking developer experience is on this when we look at this list of different things we can do you know, none of this has anything to do with developer experience and development speed. You have two code bases in two languages that don't have strong types in between them. You could use Swagger for code gen or something like that to get types on both ends. And while admittedly that does work, it's a lot more of a hassle than just having your little drizzle types work on your front end. And when I get data, it knows what it is in this many lines. Like this is so easy it's so clean with the technologies we have access to today performance is really not a problem edge runtimes are fast and io is fast in javascript and typescript cost and scale edge runtime and planet scale solved yeah solved lasting database connections this is one of the this was easily one of the strongest arguments back when all we had was serverless uh if you look i think like a year ago this was before i really was making videos and stuff but a big thing that was an issue was Everyone was using Prisma for their data layer and Prisma had pretty horrendous cold starts on a serverless environment. So it had to spin up a database connection, it had to spin up a Rust binary, it had to do all this stuff so we could get these really nasty cold starts. And when you had something like just a standalone Golang backend, that's just a server that's always running, it's going to persist that connection to your database. So you don't have to spin up a new connection every time you get a request. It'll just work. It'll have that connection sitting there. It'll be ready. But like I talked about earlier, database JS, it's solved. We don't have to worry about this anymore. We're using a fetch API to go get it. No cold starts, no connection, no TLS handshake. It just works. So lasting database connection really is not the big, that big of a deal. Concurrency, this one absolutely go gets the win here. If you have a sort of setup that requires concurrency, if whenever you're doing re web requests, having a concurrent model is really important to you in your business, then yeah, of course Go is better. Of course it's better to have Go routines. But I would be willing to bet that the majority of MVP level projects and building out sort of, I would bet that a lot of use cases don't need concurrency. They probably need a lot of IO and IO you can just do using transactions over SQL. So concurrency, while it's a win in the Go camp, it's more niche. Same thing with WebSockets. You know, having a more powerful server will allow you to have more WebSockets open at a lower price and at a lower scale. You can deal with more connections because you have a better, faster language. But that doesn't but a lot of use cases don't have WebSockets. They're not too common. And when you do have them, then, you know, you solve for them there. And I'm sure that there are alternative solutions. And I also want to be clear, I'm not a WebSocket guy. I've never really had to implement them in the real world. So I wouldn't go to me as a WebSocket expert. But if you have that problem, then you probably know, know the solution. And it's not this. And then really two of the other stronger ones is you know, it depends on what circumstance you're looking at here. And this is something that I probably should have opened with a little more. But when we look at the perspective of what I'm talking about here, I am talking about this from the perspective of building out apps quickly and efficiently while not mate while not compromising on developer experience and compromising on end user experience. This stack right here using SvelteKit and Drizzle and database JS, 
It's super easy on my end. It's super fast for the user and it's super, and it's a great experience on both ends, both user and developer side. Now, this is not really exclusive to SvelteKit, to be honest. This is more of a JavaScript meta framework thing where I'm pretty sure obviously Next.js has access to edge runtime and all that stuff because it's Vercel's baby. So of course it does. Um, I think Nuxt might, I don't really, I don't know much about Nuxt. I'm not a Nuxt guy. Go see someone else for that. But realistically, you know, any of these different JavaScript meta frameworks, what we're sort of talking about here is the, um, we're talking about building out an early version of an app that's not too ridiculously niche. I'm thinking about like my company, Insider Biz, or any of the litany of startups and that kind of thing that new companies are coming up all the time. You know, what you're building out there, this is a great way to do it. These technologies make you faster. They will let you ship better code. They will let you just do better stuff without having to suffer through having your own standalone backend. But if you're at scale and you're at a team size where you can have a strong dividing line between your front end and back end, when you've hit a point where your app is gigantic, you have a team of five front end engineers and five back end engineers, and all they do is just talk over a contract of a REST API defined by Swagger or something like that, then sure, it makes perfect sense to give the back end team a Golang API because all they're going to do is live in Golang world. And then the front end team can do whatever they want. They can maybe, they can still use SvelteKit so they get access to a sort of front end cloud, which basically means that they can do some stuff server side for the front end, but the big database stuff happens on the back end. But if you're a team of three or four or even one, you know, maintaining two code bases in two different languages is hard. It gets very annoying. And I can tell you from experience, especially when time has passed and between the last time you looked at it, when you're in it, it's kind of fine because it's like, okay, I know what's going on in here. But over time, that dividing line gets really annoying and you end up wanting to work on one side more than the other. And keeping that relationship strong by yourself is really, really hard. Um, and then the last thing is that having a standalone Golang backend or something is really good if you have like a mobile app and a web app all at once for like one big system. I'm actually working on a project right now that involves a mobile app and I am using a Golang backend. So this is not a I'm getting rid of Golang video. This is just in the web world. I think it's pretty compelling to say that like there's no real reason for at least my use cases currently there's no reason for me to build something like this which is effectively an app that reads and writes from a database with some business logic on top there's no reason for me to do that with a separate golang backend and i wanted there to be i really did i love I, I'm not just purely a product guy. I do love the engineering side of this. I love technologies. I love Go. I think it's super fun to write. I think it's super cool to look at these servers and do all this stuff. But when the rubber meets the road in the real world, realistically speaking, I think you're better off just doing this because it solves all the problems that it used to have. The web is getting better. It's getting faster. It's getting easier. It's getting more scalable at much lower cost. This edge runtime stuff, this planet scale stuff, all of it is super exciting and I'm gonna have videos on all of it coming soon, but I hope what you all get out of this is that, you know, Golang is great. Golang backends are awesome. I'm not getting rid of them. I'm not moving away from them. They're still awesome, but this works too. You don't have to have the separate and, you know, just doing everything in the Svelte kit backend is, uh, it's a pretty good idea. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you did, make sure to like and subscribe. We recently started a Discord. I'll have a link for that down below. Make sure to join up. We've had great conversations and tons of awesome people come in and going over Salt Kids stuff, going over Golang stuff and a bunch of random stuff in between. It's been awesome. So make sure to join that. I hope you guys enjoyed this and I will see you very soon.